I mean, we were delighted to be joined at that demo by Richard Leonard, mm -hmm. uh, who came along. And I think it's, it's an appropriate thing to talk about because uh, it very much is part of an industrial strategy, the issue of the Royal Bank of Scotland bank closures. Because if we were serious about having a fair industrial strategy in this country, and we publicly own most of a bank, we would not be closing it and getting rid of jobs that are important for workers in rural communities, nor would we be closing important key services uh, for, for communities uh, in rural areas. So uh, it's a, a, a tangible example of what we mean when we talk about having an industrial strategy that is actually fair. Um, and the other thing, it was a good congress actually, the STUC, because there was a lot of uh, action taken. Another thing, touching on what Lynn's saying about the Fair Work Agenda, that struck me as it was deeds, not words, uh, that probably helped to defend uh, Western Bartonshire Council uh, facility time for reps, because I doubt very much if we would have had the news through 10 minutes before the First Minister spoke that the SNP local authority had decided to uh, not get rid of uh, the facility time for all its conveners and to reverse that decision. If it hadn't been that the First Minister was very worried about a Unite Direct action that was about to take place while she was on the platform. So, you know, deeds not words do make a difference. And today what I'm going to focus on is uh, Unite's own industrial strategy because while uh, it's important that we argue for governments to implement the right industrial strategy for working people, we must be mindful that the best people to make an industrial strategy happen on the ground are trade unions. That is the best way that we are going to bring a real industrial strategy that is fair for workers about. It's going to be fought and won, workplace by workplace, agreement by agreement, eh, through a collective bargaining model, and that is where we're going to get the fairness eh, that, that we need. Again, deeds not words are going to be important in delivering the sort of industrial strategy that we're talking about. And I will touch as well, particularly on automation, which is a huge issue that we are uh, facing up to in our union at the moment, and what we are, you know, working on in terms of what the response should be to automation, uh, as, as they're calling it, Industry 4.0. So I would, I would say that uh, you know, we absolutely welcome the work that's been done in Scottish Labour because it's starting to show an understanding of the sort of industrial strategy that would be compatible with what trade unionists and working people really need. Uh, it's all very well to talk about fair work, but you must have a fair economy to deliver fair work. And so you really have to look at fundamental and radical change to our current economic systems if we're going to do anything more than just tinker around the edges. So Unite launched its own uh, broad industrial strategy a couple of years ago um, and that work and the work that we're currently doing uh, has been spearheaded uh, by Sharon Graham, our executive officer who heads up our organising and leverage department. And some of the central pillars uh, of our industrial strategy were around empowering our reps uh, around the issues of secure work, stronger voice and better pay and making sure that we are giving them the sort of tools that they need to actually run live and active campaigns in the workplace and whatever level they are currently at to understand the need to continue to push up and push forward uh, to make sure that they are getting you know in the private sector a fair share of the profits in the public sector a decent uh, level of living wage employment job security and investment from governments. So across Unite overall we have 25,000 uh, collective bargaining agreements or thereabouts and as part of our broad industrial strategy our aim is to support our reps and officers to become strike ready across all those collective bargaining agreements and what we mean by the concept of strike ready is, is about ensuring that those workers understand how to exercise their collective power, that they've got themselves organised to the max, so that every time they walk in to deliver a negotiation, 
uh, that negotiation is based on the employer looking them in the eye and knowing that they could take strike action. The more the employer knows you could take successful strike action, the less likely you will be to have to go down that route. So that is the, the kind of uh, mantra that we are preaching to our, our reps at the moment. Um, and, and also looking at finding ways through new technology to actually deliver the sort of tools that reps need. So, for example, one of the things we launched recently was our pay claim generator, um, and over 10,000 of our workplace reps have actually uh, plugged into that and, and used it. It can basically allow you to access straight into the FAME accounts to put your information in about what workplace you are, what employer you are, to find out about the profits they're making, the profits the umbrella company that owns them are making, what comparable uh, workers are getting across your industry, and you can produce a really good GP claim in about 10 minutes uh, and get it out. So this is great because it allows uh, groups of reps to sit down to, to look at all the areas that they could be pushing up on. Uh, it gives them a range of ideas uh, right across, you know, from better parental leave agreement to health and safety aspects to representation. Uh, it's all there and hopefully what it's going to do is give our reps ideas about what, what things that they, they could be doing to push back uh, and push up as we were talking about. So, you know, those are the sorts of things uh, that we're working on. But then we also have substantial pockets of membership across tens of thousands of non-recognised workplaces. Uh, we have members across 75,000 plus non-recognised areas um, and those areas also are areas that we are starting to map out and look at and start to understand where are the pockets of membership, what could we do with them so that we can push out our collective bargaining coverage because you know it's not the law alone that's going to change that, it's unions going out and work, working with people on the ground and organising workers on the ground. So there's a lot of thought going into what sort of resource do we need to really make that happen. Uh, retraining of our officers, looking at our organising resources to see whether we have got the coverage that we need to be able to really make a difference if we're going to break out and organise in those precarious areas. Uh, the hospitality industries, all of those areas where we don't have the collective bargaining coverage uh, that we would want to have. Um, and then the other fundamental part of our industrial strategy is and has to be growth. Uh, and, you know, there is strength in numbers and if we do not have strong unions, we will not be able to fight the things that are coming at us now. So, you know, that has always got to be underpinning what we look at. And you know, it is also about political education, it's about awareness raising, uh, it's the old, uh, and we, you know, we made it the STUC theme this year because uh, it's important, educate, educate, agitate, organise, you know, those are the fundamental principles and once you start to empower people in the workplace, they start to understand that they need more from their governments as well. If people experience that collective empowerment, they will want to change really change our politics too so again what you know another reason why it's fundamental that we think about that workplace level of a uh, collectivization so one of the biggest changes that we are facing and challenges that we are facing is automation and it's not new uh, of, of course it's not new we have the first and second industrial revolutions uh, uh, and you know we we had machines coming in we had a uh, electricity and steam powered machinery that created huge workplaces. I mean it was from these things in the 18th and 19th centuries that modern trade unionism was born, uh, that we managed to collectivise workers, that we managed to win the weekend for workers, that we stopped children from working and got them into free education. Uh, you know, we created a movement that then created the National Health Service. We built a society on the back of these industrial revolutions. And, you know, unfortunately, the third industrial revolution in the 1980s, uh, it could be argued, started to push back on the gains that trade unions had made. It brought in the notion of privatisation, it broke down collectivism and collective consciousness. Uh, and, you know, it, it, the, the saying was from pits to poundland, and there's probably a lot of truth in that. We certainly moved massively from a manufacturing industry to much more of a service-based industry and trade unionism uh, 
was very much uh, under attack and in the in the decline. Uh, so you know, an industrial revolution not good uh, for workers. And I have to say that this time, what we're facing now uh, with Industry 4.0. Uh, you know, they're saying it'll be like nothing we've ever experienced before because the pace of change now and the development of artificial intelligence uh, means that we could be looking at huge amounts of jobs being automated and disappearing. And, you know, we, all of the economists across the spectrum are saying they're not, you know, there will be new opportunities created, but one of the things our society could be facing and, and may well be facing is huge job losses. So that's obviously a, a kind of key issue uh, that we have to be looking at. So it's, it's true that this time we, we could be looking at something catastrophic, I guess you could be saying. We've done some work and uh, we're looking at between 35 and 42 percent of current jobs uh, that could be going according to the research uh, the United has done. Uh, we would estimate that almost 230,000 uh, of our jobs could go by 2035 uh, and, you know, in our membership. Uh, so it's a, a massive issue. Uh, and the sort of things that are, are causing this, well, you've got the Internet of Things, uh, which is the idea that machines can talk to each other without any intervention uh, from humans. So you can go from manufacturing to distribution to, uh, you know, the truck, uh, which is not automated yet, but could be to deliver it to, to the end source, uh, all being done without any human intervention. Uh, you could have uh, artificial intelligence in the sense of machines that learn as they go, uh, who are, d are developing algorithms that are actually very anti-equality. So, you know, if the computer decides that the perfect engineer, based on all the evidence they've gathered uh, of what good engineers look like, is white middle-aged male, then we may well find that people who don't fit that profile are getting farmed out of the processes. It will be, it will be a very cold... Uh, way forward if we're not careful and the one thing which I think is the most sinister thing of all that they haven't been able to teach the machines to do yet is have empathy and my god what a society we're going to be if we don't have human empathy uh, in, in us so you know these are uh, the things that we're facing uh, 20,000 jobs could go from our food industry alone uh, we could be looking at the end of all call centres uh, in about 10 years' time if artificial intelligence keeps going the way it is in terms of humans actually de delivering those sorts of services. So it's a serious issue and it's one that we need to really get prepared for and really engage with and be prepared to fight back, not roll over. Uh, a lot of people have talked about universal basic income. Uh, and. The position that's beginning to develop within my union is that that is not the silver bullet that people thought it was. It's not going to uh, be the simple uh, solution to this because uh, you know it depends who's making the decisions about who gets the universal basic income. It depends who's deciding how much it is. It, de it could create a complete underclass uh, of forgotten people. It could create extreme exploitation of people. It could make workers scared that they're going to, you know, in the small pool of jobs that are still there. It could allow capitalists to push down on the paying conditions of those lucky enough to be a little bit above that. Uh, <clears throat> would we bother, you know, would some governments even want to bother educating the underclass who are on the UBI uh, with any new skills? You know, there are, there are a, a lot of... Uh, worrying scenarios when people do not have the right to work, the right to, uh, you know, earn their own uh, money. So there's there's a lot to think about in that. Uh, and, you know, what we believe is that this round of automation, you can't stop it, but you can take advantage of it. Actually, if it was used in the right way, it could be a tremendous force for good. It could benefit all workers. It could create a more equal workplace. It could create all sorts of benefits, but we need to make sure that those benefits affect the many and not the few. So we've got to change the narrative. And what we've started by doing is we've done workshops. I think we've spoken to over 3,000 of our workplace reps so far across Unite. And what we're trying to do is build a knowledge base of what automation is coming in now 
try and build a risk register of how, how that will come in, how it will affect them. You can say yes to something that looks fairly innocuous and it's the implications of what that leads to a few years down the line. Uh, and we need to make sure that this is of benefit, not of detriment to workers. So we are looking at, you know, as I said, we've got to be strike ready, we've got to be powerful if we're going to have a, a decent dialogue with employers around this. Uh, we're looking at bargaining guides and uh, looking at how we would educate our reps to give them more knowledge about the new technologies coming in and what it could mean for them and their workforce. Uh, and one of the biggest areas we're looking at is how do we develop a political manifesto around Industry 4.0 that we would very much hope the Labour Party will then, you know, take forward on behalf of working people because these gains have got to benefit workers, we've got to create greater equality, we should be saying there should be no loss of income if, if certain skills are taken over by computers, no de-skilling, there are new skills out there to be learned. Uh, we should be talking about a lower a retirement age, we should be talking about a shorter working week, we should be talking about longer holidays, better maternity and paternity leave, we should be talking about tax and tariffs on big business every time they eliminate a job, we should be outlawing the anti-dehumanisation of certain industries, services, jobs uh, and really strengthen up the right to work narrative uh, and make sure that we are absolutely safeguarding the quality of access to education about who learns these new skills that will be the new uh, you know transaction of our economy as we move forward so it's a huge agenda for change that we need to undertake here if we have to protect the sort of ideals that people like us hold dear in a society we want to continue to have a society with an NHS where people feel that they have a right to a decent living wage and decent uh, you know, quality of life. So for me that's why uh, the Scottish Labour industrial strategy is very, very tiny uh, and some of the work that, that I know Richard will spearhead for all the reasons that Lynn said. I'm really delighted at a personal level to have a Labour leader who understands that if we're going to truly be world leaders in fair work, then we need a radical change to our economy. So with it, the SNP government, uh, you know, they, they had great anti-austerity rhetoric. They say lovely things about us at the STUC and about union reps when they're forced to. Um, and they talk about key performance indicators for collective bargaining as if it's going to uh, create the, the real change. But I don't think that is going to create real change. I think it still is rhetoric. It is words, not deeds. And we need deeds, not words. And I think the thing about Richard and Jeremy Corbyn is that they understand that it's going to take public ownership and control of our key sectors, like transport and energy, to change our economy and to deliver a proper industrial strategy. It's going to take the repeal of anti-trade union employment laws. It's going to take the elimination of zero-hour contracts. It's going to take worker buyouts that facilitate real industrial democracy. And it's going to take an end to the private profiteering of our public services. It's going to take a complete overhaul of our procurement practices. It's going to take long-term planning and investment. It's going to take sectoral bargaining where we ensure that right across sectors, workers are covered and have collective rights. And it's going to take the political will and the vision to ensure that it's the many and not the few who reap the benefits of automation. So, in short, it's going to take nothing less than the election of an unashamedly socialist Labour government, and that's what Richard and Jeremy can deliver for us. Thank you very much.